petrol prices 2008. We've got much of the world in lockdown. Uh, we've got 100 countries shutting schools, which was always seen as a last resort. Um, uh, and of course, most of us here, I would hope, are, are watching this um, from home. The biggest uh, impact so far has been a, a huge reduction in mobility. Uh, and so this uh, graphic is just showing the, uh, the international passenger travel uh, in recent weeks. We've seen air travel down 30% you know, in the five biggest US airports, uh, and it's gonna, get, it's gonna get worse. Passenger transport has ground to a halt. Uh, we're now starting to see restrictions on maritime traffic too, which is obviously most disruptive for the short sea trades. But, uh, but also for sectors that, uh, you know, that demand higher contact between crew and port workers. We're trying to find, you know, charts in this presentation that give, you know, illustrate the impact of this, of this virus. And of course, it is, it's so dramatic and so fast that, um, you know, a lot of the statistics that are emerging, official statistics won't really cover it. You know, there's generally a, a month or so delay on official statistics. Um, so we're typically relying on um, price movements, on forward curves. Um, we've got some statistics emerging on how China has dealt with the, uh, the, the lockdown recently. Um, and, um, you know, they're certainly coming out uh, worse than we'd expected. Um, we've got, you know, as a leading indicator, the, the uh, global stock market's crashing. Uh, S&P 500 down 30%, which is the worst since the financial crisis. Uh, you know, what we've seen so far, retail sales in China, you know, we thought we'd be down by 4%. Uh, it's, it's over 20% down. Uh, China GDP growth is now 10% down in Q1. Um, as I said, we're getting some good news out of China. We're getting many fewer uh, new cases of corona. We've got about 90% of the big industrial firms back in business. Um, but obviously this uh, assumes uh, there's no second wave uh, of restrictions to mobility um if if this virus uh, comes comes back into play just a quick word on oil prices um you know since the beginning of march uh, oil prices have really crashed um we've seen um you know this spat between saudi arabia and russia um where you know they've chosen a, a rather unfortunate moment to cut uh, to massively hike oil exports um, this comes at a time when demand for oil was already falling hard. I mean, really since the start of the year uh, due to Chinese lockdowns. Um, and obviously as the crisis spreads globally, we're now expecting demand to be down 7 million barrels a day in March and April, so about 7% down uh, globally. So it's an unfortunate time for Saudi Arabia to, uh, to suddenly flood the market with extra crude certainly as far as the oil price is concerned for those that depend on higher oil prices. The, um, the higher exports, as you well know, are a reaction to Russia's failure to agree to share the burden of production cuts with OPEC earlier this month. Um, we've seen, uh, or we will see, an extra three and a half million barrels a day out of the Middle East alone, um, which is well above uh, sustainable production levels. So it's, it's unclear how long this can be sustained. Um, but this means, you know, Brent's come down from $70 a barrel to $26 a barrel. WTI is down to 22, I think it is at the moment. It could fall further, which is very bad news for oil companies. It's very bad news for oil producing nations. You know, you're generally looking at about $51 a barrel as a break-even cost, for, as a global median break-even cost for um, oil production. So, so these, this sort of oil price, this is, uh, you know, grounds for further social unrest and all sorts of unintended uh, um, repercussions. It's very bad news for the offshore sector, obviously. Um, it's particularly bad news for the U.S. Uh, shale oil sector, and obviously all the industries associated with that, whether that's petrochemicals or uh, liquefied petroleum gas or ethane. Um, U.S. shale production is very uh, sensitive to uh, investment. So although some of the production is, is hedged forward um, for 2020, not really beyond 2020, um, when investment falls, we generally find there's a very quick decline in, in production. Um, so, and, and that has lots of implications for the global tanker market um, and also you know, so specialized tankers and gas carriers and offshore and so on. Um, it's obviously bad news also for the future 
exploration and uh, uh, production uh, investment. It is good news for the global economy, but for the fact that we're all on lockdown, so we can't benefit from it. Just an idea um, on this chart. This, sorry, let me go back a chart. On this chart, looking at uh, this is the IEA's view earlier this month. Uh, the impact that Corona is having on oil demand. Um, this is in the IEA's monthly report. Uh, thought we'd lost about two and a half million barrels a day in Q1. But we're expecting a, a V-shaped recovery, um, which would lead to a loss of oil demand in the year uh, of just under 100,000 barrels a day. Um, that's looking very conservative now. Um, you know, some people are expecting April alone to have lost about 11 million barrels of demand. Um, you know, our more recent forecasts for the year, we've seen, you know, some forecasts by major uh, forecasting agencies coming in at a loss of 1.1 million barrels a day. I've seen uh, 2.8 million barrels a day loss for the year. And most of these forecasts, bear in mind, were pre-lockdowns. So there's a downside risk to those as well. Um, the OECD, for instance, said today that the euro, euro area uh, would shrink by 12% GDP, shrink by 12% in Q2. Now, what impact has that had on uh, shipping markets? Well, interestingly, tank freight markets, you may or may not know, have so far done very well out of this, certainly since the oil price collapsed um, early March. Um, the effect of Saudi Arabia pushing more crude onto the market has obviously um, come, uh, entailed a surge of fixing by Saudi Arabia and UAE and others. Um, that's combined with a, a much lower bunker price, obviously, which has boosted tanker earnings. But most importantly, we've had a very steep contango develop in the oil markets, which makes um, effectively makes the fleet much less efficient. So we're using vessels to store crude oil now. Uh, we're using vessels to do longer routing. We're, we're generally slow steaming to a certain extent. Um, and this has produced, uh, uh, it's, it's constrained the available supply on the market. Uh, and earlier this week, we had some very, very strong rates, you know, for VLCCs, beyond $200,000 a day for owners. That's time travel equivalent own, uh, earnings. Um, that market's given away uh, towards the end of last week. There's a lot of uncertainty still out there. A lot of the floating storage time charters that we saw fixed have since failed, uh, have been renegotiated. So very difficult to get a clear picture on where the tanker market's going. But interesting to see that so far, um, the, the impact has been mostly on the positive side. If you look at how the forward market, how South forward sentiment has changed, you know, over that period, you can see pretty much all the quarters there. The highest blue line you're looking at is uh, is the balance of, of March, obviously very strong tracing the spot market. But um, even the second half of this year, those those uh, forward uh, FFA contracts are still fairly strong relative to where they were earlier in the year. Um, so really Q2, so Q3, Q4 um, still viewed to be reasonably strong as a result of uh, what's happening on the contango structure. For dry bulk freight market, um, the same cannot be said, unfortunately. Uh, some of the smaller asset classes, handies, supermaxes, and so on, we have seen a slight uptick recently, but that's really only a result of the lower bunker prices. Um, the Cape market um, has seen, you know, been coming off really since the end of last year, beginning of this year. Um, there's a lot of damage um, that uh, we're expecting to see on, on the Cape sector. So far, you know, iron ore prices have been strong because there's been supply issues for iron ore as well. Um, but we're seeing very high stock levels of finished, uh, you know, steel products, for instance. Uh, we would uh, believe that the loss of demand and the high stocks um, would certainly slow down import levels, uh, particularly for the Cape size, uh, for the larger dry bulk vessels. And there you can see for the forward, the same view of the forward curve, um, almost all the quarters, um, you know, is going further out to 2021. They've all lost ground. So, so uh, sentiment has, has fallen for those quarters. Sometimes it's difficult to tell whether these contracts are not just being sold to uh, preserve cash, which is another possibility. But uh, certainly I, I would say the sentiment has, has declined quite comfortably since the uh, sort of global lockdown has kicked in. Very briefly, container markets, um, we've seen um, containerized rates uh, decline since the beginning of this year. Uh, if you look at volumes of TEUs at, uh, you know, the major ports around the world, we're seeing significantly down, and that's February. And so obviously, you know, 
I, I think the in Q1, the American Association of Port Authorities said that uh, their their volumes were 20 percent down, um, and I think that's just the start of it. So we're definitely going to see a, a reduction in container containerized trade. Longer term, um, just going back to those forward curves, which are only really the you know they're the only useful um, uh, metrics that we have as this market's changing so fast. For tankers, the deferred contracts 21 and 22, you know, they're holding up reasonably well, not at uh, particularly exciting levels, but certainly not a deterioration. That's been a strengthening, um, but not so for the dry. Again, this could be partly a, a sell off of, uh, of, of those contracts. But uh, my uh, assumption, certainly that of, of our uh, dry bulk analysts, is that um, a lot of confidence has been lost in, in that market. Going forward, the one thing we would say, uh, not that we're under any sort of uh, you know, obligation to give a positive note with these presentations, but one key comparison that we often be heard recently with 2008 financial crisis and how that would impact freight markets, how this crisis would impact freight markets. In 2008, we had a huge order book. We had uh, five years of forward cover within the order books. There was nothing you could do about those vessels coming into the market. Uh, right now, really, 2021 is looking pretty light for dry bulk. 2022 is very light. On tankers, 21 is quite busy, but 22 is virtually empty. Um, we've got an old fleet relative to what we had in, 20, in 2008. So really, it's in owner's control much more now than it was in 2008, how this market develops long term. Um, if there is limited ordering, there is a possibility owners could come out of this OK, even though demand were expecting to be very hard hit. Um, but of course, if there's a resurgence of ordering, then we're in a whole heap of trouble. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I hope that hopefully that's given you a, a little idea of, of where we are uh, on the markets. So obviously, um, thank you very much for your attention and, uh, and stay healthy. But back to you, Joss. Uh, Henry, thank you so much for that presentation. I've certainly got a few questions to to ask you after that, but we'll we'll save that for the questions period because I'm sure they could well be replicated in the from the from the participants' questions. Um, I'd now like to, and it's interesting that you brought up um, yards and, and new builds at the end of your presentation, because I'd now like to pass over to Beth Bradley, who's partner at Hill Dickinson who will provide the contractual view of COVID-19, I think with a, uh, with a particular focus on the effect that the shutdown of Chinese and Southeast Asian yards have had uh, and, the, and the subsequent contractual issues. So, uh, Beth, I'd like to uh, pass over to you. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think overall, uh, since all of this kicked off kind of towards the end of January, what's become very apparent in most of the, the, the sectors that I deal with on the dry shipping side and the shipbuilding side is that none of the usual contractual documents in their, certainly in their unamended forms, are remotely adequate for uh, dealing um, with the crisis that COVID-19 is showing, and particularly more that it, it has become a, a, a rolling problem um, as it has gone global. So I will quickly jump through the kind of problems or, or, or the lack of assistance in most time and voyage charters uh, for any of the parties within the chartering chain, and then I will come on to uh, the position under the shipbuilding contracts with a, a particular focus on Article 8 of the SAJ form. And the other thing that has become clear uh, is that particularly for time and voyage charters, that, that there has been very, very little uh, uptake of the BIMCO clauses, which were created in response to the Ebola outbreak in 2015. Um, not only have they not been used, but similar clauses have not been adopted either. Um, and the BIMCO clauses, I have to say, are, are, are exist both for time and voyage charters, and they are not without criticism um, by any means, but they do offer uh, a, some protection against or, or in relation to the, the, the shifting of risk uh, where a vessel is trading or may be trading uh, in areas which are affected by pandemics or epidemics such as the COVID-19 one. Now, as time has moved on from the, the end of January to now, there is a wider circulation or, or a circulation beginning to happen, either of amended BIMCO clauses for, for the purposes of new business 
or uh, we are certainly being instructed to uh, try to put together bespoke suites of COVID-19 clauses. Um, contractually, the, the difficulty, in, or one of the difficulties that we're confronted with in, in trying to draft uh, suites of clauses to, to attempt to deal with the imbalancing or upending of risks um, that, that is going on is that uh, in order to try and provide a full clause that deals with the different aspects of what may or may not happen, um, you end up with an exceptionally long and very tedious clause, which still doesn't cover all eventualities. It's very much a moving, moving phase. Uh, Anyway, so moving on to the, the kind of main headline issues that certainly we've been given advice on since the, the end of January and mid-February, um, and depending on where you are in the chartering chain, I'll, I'll jump through both owners, time charters and voyage charters before looking at the shipbuilding issues. So the main thing, or the main problem that's confronted owners is, is that whether or, or the question of particularly when it was looking at the, the, the issue was confined to, within Asia, was whether or not they were willing to agree to accept an order uh, to a port in, in an affected area. Um, and, and a lot of owners were very concerned about uh, allowing their ships and, and, and exposing their crew to ports in China. Now, one of the difficulties with that um, is that the, this kind of rolling epidemic is not necessarily a safety issue um, from the point of view of the, the kind of doctrine of the safe port warranty. Um, so it's been very hard to, to find a way of advising owners or, or, or advising owners how to step through um, or, or try and avoid exposing their crew and indeed them, uh, their, the vessel to lengthy delays. Uh, in the absence of anything in their uh, time charter or voyage charter, if direct, that deals or, or gave them an enhanced ability uh, to turn down an order in this situation. Um, the, the BIMCO suite of clauses it, it does have a much wider uh, uh, approach than the safe port warranty and appears also to allow owners to turn down an order to a, a port in a defined affected area if there is a concern not just because of the crew health but uh, in terms of any uh, problems that the owner might have in fixing future business and I think that is going to be a live problem um, now but more perhaps that will uh, that I'll be able to give more details on uh, when it comes to looking at the late time into marriage regime but the, the potential impact on owners' earnings if they've been to or traded through an area where there is an epidemic outbreak um, is, is a big issue for them. Um, in terms of off-hire rights under the time charter, they're very limited applicability, uh, I think, in terms of the COVID-19 epidemic on the NYP 1946 form, depending on the facts uh, or, or, or the delay that the charters are seeking to claim off hire in respect of, uh, it seems to me that only uh, uh, possibly at a push restraint of princes might apply, um, or deficiency of crew if there was a, a, an outbreak of illness on board. Um, but otherwise, there's you know, simply very limited uh, standard relief in the time charter. Um, skipping down to voyage uh, charter parties, it's the late time and demurrage regime where I think uh, the biggest impact will be felt. Um, the default position, particularly for an owner, is that the notice of rent can only be given uh, or, or can only be given validly if uh, the vessel is in all respects ready and that readiness will cover the vessel's free critique. Um, so the health clearance of the crew. The default position is that a master can tend to notice of readiness without it being, uh, without the port having necessarily given free critique clearance. Um, and that's where the master has no uh, reason to believe that there may be a problem with the health of the crew. Um, but I think the problem now is with so many countries affected uh, that it, the kind of idea that there will not be greater questions about the, 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 
or, or, or greater scrutiny in terms of crew health is likely to lead to further delays. And so, uh, free critique um, possibly does now have to, or, or, or depending on which country or in which port you're giving notice of, probably would have to be obtained before it could be said that the notice of readiness has been validly tendered. Now, that, of course, leaves owners with you know, potentially quite lengthy uh, delays before they're able to tender a notice of readiness, particularly if the port is very busy and there's insufficient personnel to, to quickly process the, the health clearance or free critique. Um, so that's a problem for owners, but then it switches once the late time has commenced to a potentially big problem for the voyage charterers, uh, because there are very few standard terms which in, uh, enable late time to be interrupted for some of the delays that have been experienced, particularly in ports around China and Singapore as a result of the COVID-19. Um, the Asbatank Boy form does have a, 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 a pre-printed quarantine exception to late time, which may be of some assistance, but otherwise, uh, and without anything in the, in the voyage charter, late time will run, and once it's over, they'll and if the cargo is still being worked, there's potentially sizable demurrage bills, which the voyage charter uh, may be responsible for. So that's the position, really, is that in, in terms of the highlights under the main dry shipping contracts. And I will just move quickly on to uh, force majeure, and particularly Article 8 of the SAJ form uh, in the shipbuilding contract. Now, force majeure is a, a pretty poorly understood concept. Um, it, it, there have been numerous inquiries, and I'm sure I'm not alone in, in having dealt with them as to where the force majeure can be um, declared in relation to the delays that have arisen from the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, as with Article 8, and I'll go into that in some detail, the, the structure of most force majeure clauses is that they'll have a list of events, followed by some general wording, um, which is a to cause a prevention or delay in the performance of certain obligations and will often uh, contain a notice requirement and the clause itself will set out the relief that's being offered to the party who's able to rely on it. Um, there is a very strict interpretive approach to how the, the, the kind of force majeure clause operates and COVID-19 has given rise to some quite interesting or, or, or difficult issues, um, particularly around causation, where you have to demonstrate that there is a relevant event that's within the clause that is causing the, the, the prevention of performance. Um, I'll talk about this in the context of Article 8, not least because I can see I'm running out of time. Um, Article 8 of the SAJ form, in its unamended uh, form, is quite a widely drawn force majeure clause in terms of the number of events which could be applicable uh, to delays arising from COVID-19. It's not a bad list uh, uh, to look at. Um, it is very, very, very favourable to the ship builder. Um, what Article 8 seeks to do is, where there is a relevant force majeure, it entitles the builder to claim, um, uh, in its unamended form, up to 210 days of permissible delay. And so that's a delay which they are not uh, responsible to pay liquidated damages for. Um, and they get 210 days of that before the buyer has a right to rescind the contract. Um, the relevant events under Article 8 uh, in the present situation seem to meet the require, uh, requirements of government authorities, labour shortages, epidemic, a delay or failure in transportation, shortages of materials, uh, and other causes beyond the reasonable control of the builder. And so these fall quite neatly into the, the types of issues that, that were arising in certainly by late February in China, as shipyards were being forced uh, really to close down. Um, on the whole, by a lack of personnel, so the, the difficulties that people move in from their, their their homes for the celebrations for the Chinese New Year back to their jobs and the various quarantine restrictions that have been placed on them. Um, so Article 8 is quite a broadly drafted clause. It does require that uh, notice is given. Uh, uh, within 10 days from the date of occurrence of any cause of delay. Uh, that is a slightly difficult 
calculation to make because you have to be certain uh, in drafting the notice that you've identified identity the correct event, the one that is causative of the, the delay, um, uh, and also that you identify it and give notice of it within 10 days of the, the delay occurring. Um, where there are problems with notices being given, and I think certainly some of the initial ones um, coming out of some of the yards in in, in China uh, were not particularly well um, formulated, uh, and as a consequence, not only did they fail to identify arguably the correct event, but also fail to give notice within time. There are potentially issues there uh, on a te of a technical nature, so that if the notice itself is incorrect, it cannot be corrected subsequently, and so there may be an invalid uh, claim for permissible delay by the builder. Uh, so a great care needs to be taken there. Um, right, I have really running out of time. Um, so that's a really quick whiz through the kind of the highlights of some of the problems that have occurred um, and that we've seen instructions uh, in relation to from kind of February onwards. The kind of curious thing is that as China is starting and slowly getting back back to normal, particularly on the shipbuilding side, uh, while there are delays that have been caused by the kind of quarantine measures and, and the displacement of people and, and, and illness um, it, that has affected to some extent or a greater extent than, than other sun yards. Um, the problem now is going to be in the ability of the buyers to get the right personnel to the yards in order to in order that sea trials, for example, can take place. Um, because there are going to be increasingly strict uh, measures taken against anybody coming from uh, uh, outside China to the yards, whether it's a complete ban or a quarantine. Um, so getting superintendents, crew on board, or indeed as, as class surveyors uh, is going to be the, the, the next disruptive factor for the things which are pleasant, presently on the blocks. Okay, so in conclusion, there's been a whole heap of difficult issues to consider, and um, as this goes on, I think the issues are going to become more complex and, 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 and more perhaps intractable um, as time moves over. Okay, so thank you very much. Beth, uh, thank you so much for that uh, overview of some of the contractual headaches that counterparties are experiencing uh, throughout this COVID-19 outbreak of, of particular interest, of course, and not one considers the, is the issue of as China comes back online, uh, the inability of class societies and ship owners, et cetera, to be able to get out uh, to the yards for sea trials, et cetera, which, which is not something I had, I had previously considered. Now, of course, um, uh, COVID-19 has not only created significant contractual issues, but it's also affecting uh, seafarers at, at the coalface of the industry. And of course, issues around quarantine and ship transfer are significant and I expect are only destined to grow. Um, we now, I'd now like to introduce, introduce Ella Hagel, who's Divisional Director of Britannia P&I, uh, who actually, due to uh, connectivity issues, is dialing in here, so she can't actually see what's, what's going on live on the screen. So, um, Ella, thank you for the, for the significant effort you've made to join us here this afternoon. Um, uh, I'd now like to pass the floor over to you to run through some of the some of the practical problems that owners and operators are experiencing and, and how uh, P and I are, are looking to resolve those. But before I do, I'd also like to sort of open the virtual floor, if you like, or, or the text box to, to questions for our presenters, which I'll, I'll then look to uh, field uh, directly after Ella has finished presenting. So Ella, thanks so much and over to you. Thank you very much, Joss. <clears throat> so I head the people risk department at the club. So the focus of this uh, short talk will be in effect um, on handling of routine crew claims. CFAIR is very much on the front line of this global calamity to, to quote the IMO last week. But of course, the effects of the uh, pandemic are being felt in some way across the shipping industry um, as a whole and across the club. So, for example, uh, my colleagues have mentioned difficulty in finding cargo surveyors to attend on board. 
um, as you well know, problems can often be knocked on the head early by the intervention of a, of a surveyor. We have had one example of a survey inspection being carried out remotely, but um, who knows whether that will stand up as a good evidence uh, in a court uh, at a later date. Um, we've had uh, instances of stevedores refusing to work cargo until a doctor could be found to come on board to confirm that the vessel was all clear of the virus. Um, and some of the problems arise not only in getting people on, but getting people off. Um, so we had a case last week where the owner was left with four armed guards on board um, due to the, the, the charters having repudiated the charter. And um, it's not an easy, uh, easy matter to get them off. And only yesterday we were notified of a case where one of our member ships rescued three people from a sinking boat off Venezuela, uh, one of whom turned out to have a fever. So the suspicion is it's malaria, uh, not COVID-19, but we can just imagine the difficulties we're going to have uh, to persuade the authorities to allow him to get off. So going back to the crew claims that we handle, I think our biggest concern at the outset of, uh, of this um, epidemic as it was, was that we wouldn't be able to get sick and injured crew off ships um, in an emergency situation. I'm not talking about COVID-19. We haven't actually had a case of COVID-19 on any of our vessels, but I, I do believe some of the other clubs have had. So really, our problem is is just dealing with the, the routine cases, well, I say routine emergency cases. So um, there has been some delay in getting permission for them to disembark or getting a doctor on board. But um, in our experience, um, we have managed to get that permission in a serious medical emergency. It may take a little bit longer because of the, the pressures on the, the local authorities, but we have so far uh, managed. Um, but as I say, we've heard some, some horror stories from other clubs, and that is very much a cause for concern. Our own problems have actually been getting um, getting deceased seafarers off ships, uh, so um, both disembarking the bodies and getting them home. Um, we've got uh, a couple that have been stuck in transit for some months now, and of course that's causing enormous distress to the families involved, so it's not, uh, not something to be um, overlooked at all. So let's assume that we get them off. Um, the, the problems escalate from there. You have delay in getting um, access to the hospitals for updates, so we, we, it's difficult to find out what's happening with them, what's wrong with them. And then the problems really begin once they're fit to travel, because um, as both Henry and Beth have mentioned, there are extreme restrictions on, on movement. And so we've got um, crew stuck all over the world at the moment who are um, fit to travel again and can't go anywhere. I've got a couple in Panama and one down the road from me actually in um, Sheerness, poor guy. Um, but it's, it's a serious problem because um, until those flight restrictions are lifted, they're, they're stuck where they are. Some members are trying to reposition vessels to pick them up, but that doesn't always solve the problem because you've then still got to be able to disembark them somewhere else. Um, you're just moving the problem in some senses. So crew stuck in transit is a real problem. Um, and uh, this is not just for the, the, the crew who have been disembarked sick or injured. It's also for uh, on regular on-signers and off-signers who are obliged to be quarantined ashore. Um, and uh, you may have actually read in the press that a number of the, of the big um, ship owners have decided to suspend crew changes for this reason, because um, this is to protect their seafarers from being stranded um, in transit. So if you have a happy, healthy crew on board, then it, it might be the most sensible option to keep them there if you can. So um, once we've got them home and the problems continue, um, we've seen delays in the continuation of their treatment, uh, delays in getting disability assessments. Uh, this might be because of uh, internal transport restrictions, but also uh, because a lot of them are being given advice not to go to hospital except in cases of emergency um, because of the risk of, of catching something else. Um, this is obviously all having um, a tremendous impact um, on the seafarers themselves and their, their mental and their physical um, welfare. That's not really within, within the scope of this short talk, but it is something to bear in mind. And I saw uh, last week that the Sailor Society are now offering virtual crew support because they too have been obliged to suspend the physical attendance of all their chaplains on board um, who normally provide a very valuable service to those seafarers. So what, what are the clubs doing to help? 
well, apart from the handling of the claims and, and, and the reimbursement of the covered expenses, of course, um, our local correspondents are a very useful source of up-to-date information about the restrictions in place uh, in various ports and countries. It's all moving so fast, it's very difficult uh, to keep up. Um, at the outset of this um, epidemic, as it was, um, the clubs were all disseminating the information that they received, but now I think we've all got information overload. Our inboxes are full of updates from various sources um, every day. Um, so what we're doing now is we're trying to act as sieves to filter through the most um, relevant and, and useful and up-to-date information, depending on, on the particular uh, needs of the, um, the, the ship owner member. Um, I think um, hopefully the focus will um, ha has changed a little bit. There's a, there's a high level movement afoot. Uh, certainly at the end of last week, we saw the, the IMO um, stressing to its members the importance of, of not um, unnecessarily disrupting the flow of commerce by sea um, and urging a, a practical and pragmatic approach to issues um, like crew changes. So um, and I, I think believe last week there was also an emergency meeting of, of the um, International Chamber of Sh Shipping to discuss exactly this. So um, let's hope that um, the movement can, can start again um, uh, because obviously uh, it was having a, a massive impact on, on international trade. Um, I will pass you back to Joss now. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we will we'll now pass over to some questions from from our listeners. Uh, we currently only have one question, so I will I will start off by asking a couple. I think. Um, firstly, uh, first question goes to you, Henry. Um, given the uh, given the fall away of demand for oil in global markets at the moment and Saudi Arabia's, Saudi Arabia's continued production. Uh, what, is, what is the situation in terms of, of storage, and how long can Saudi go on pumping oil uh, when VLCCs are running out in terms of ships to store, store the oil in? Um, well, there's a lot of uh, shore-based storage. I mean, so storage is, is divided into commercial storage and strategic storage, so we've already seen some efforts to build strategic storage. Uh, so China, we think, is going to be taking in 300,000 barrels a day to take advantage of low prices. Uh, US is, is in discussions uh, to uh, buy shale to uh, fill its strategic reserves. So that's one element that has some capacity to fill. Um, commercial uh, stocks uh, will, shore-based stocks will, stocks will hit a limit fairly soon. Um, certainly at this level of, of oversupply, um, at which point you do start having to spill into into floating storage. Um, I forget how many VLs were doing floating storage back in 2000 and, uh, 2009, um, but there is a, a fair amount of capacity to, to fill, obviously, um, depending on how weak demand is. Um, a little bit depends, obviously, on the, the freight market. So if you're paying an awful lot uh, to time charter those vessels, um, then that is a, a limiting factor, uh, and the contango has to widen to accommodate that. But one would expect it will. Um, so the big question is, is obviously how long Saudi can go on uh, overproducing to this level. Um, you know, one of the constraints is it is producing above its uh, sustained uh, capacity to produce. So it's actually drawing quite a lot of crude out of its own uh, stocks, either domestic stocks or stocks held overseas. It can't going on. You go on doing that indefinitely, and it certainly can't go on um, uh, with a twenty dollar a barrel uh, oil price indefinitely. You know that could last. You know, it's it's very well positioned to do it. You know, on a global basis, but it's still that wouldn't last more than sort of you know I wouldn't put half a year. So this June, the next June meeting, they're very keen to get Russia back on board. America's very keen to get Russia back on board, um, uh, but there'll probably have to be some give on the American side as well in order to do that. So, so yeah, it's it's a huge volume of uh, surplus crude um, that's found its way into the market at a time when demand has absolutely collapsed. So it, it's a very it's a very real question and something we're seeing in, in the freight market at the moment. Henry, thanks so much for that. And just just going on into the into the wider market. Obviously, in January we saw. We saw China pretty much shut down in 
including access to ports. Um, do you feel, I mean, what's your, what's your feeling in regards to the West uh, behaving in a similar manner now that the pandemic has seemingly moved from, from East to West? Uh, and are you able to give any view as to what effect that may have on, on global markets? Well, a lot depends on what ship type and ship size you're talking about. So, you know, VLCCs and, and Cape size loading, you know, Australian iron ore, for instance, there's relatively little interaction. You know, a lot of that's done remotely. You know, as a, as a, a fellow that, you know, puts the hoses on and, uh, but there's, you know, that, that sort of level of interaction between crew and stevedores is relatively limited. Um, so I imagine that could carry on largely unaffected, although we are starting to hear, for instance, you know, India, uh, is, is talking about uh, 14 days, uh, at minimum 14 days sort of quarantine uh, for any, any port calls. You know, we're just getting details on that at the moment. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so it is starting to affect it. But of course, for the smaller vessels, for the handies on the dry side, for the short sea chem specialized tankers and so on, you know, this is becoming more of an issue, you know, where, where there is a lot of, a lot of interaction. Uh, and so we are expecting that to cause delays. Um, you know, who's compensating, you know, owners um, for ports where those delays um, are likely to happen is, is another matter. Uh, Henry, thanks, thanks so much for that overview and for your and for your presentations. And we've still got a bit of time, so if you have any other questions for for Henry, do do fire them in. Uh, the next question is coming from the stream, and it's from uh, Maritime Arbitrator and. Uh, various other things, uh, Jeffrey Blum, uh, and it's a question for Beth. Beth, can you can you see the question on the on the screen there? I can. Yes. Um, are you are you able to tackle that one? Sure. Um, I, do you want me to uh, let everybody else know what the question is, or are they able to see it too? No, no. I think I think everyone I think everyone can see the question. Great. So um, I don't know. I think I think it will become increasingly difficult for uh, uh, anybody or for owners to persuade charters to agree to a, a weather in free pretty call not a clause in the notice of readiness provision. Um, I, 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 so I think that you know the market will change that. So we'll, we won't sit around for a while. I mean there will still be those provisions in existing charters that. that may not have concluded yet, um, but I don't think there'll be any appetite for, for voyage charters to agree to all time charters. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Beth. Um, now, Ella, we've got, a, we've got a question for you. Now, unfortunately, you've not had the uh, ability to be able to see this question beforehand, but I will, I will sort of read it out to you. Um, Ella, is there a, this is being asked by Laney, is there a consistent approach uh, between the clubs regarding uh, coverage of precautionary medical evacuation? Um, yes, I believe there is. Um, our, our rules are not identical, but they're very similar. Um, and I think um, our, our whole approach is fairly consistent. There, there's quite a bit of communication going on um, behind the scenes in the international group. So, um, uh, you know, we are, we are trying to, to maintain some uh, consistency within um, the confines of our rules. Um, when you talk about um, precautionary e e evacuation, um, if you're, for example, talking about someone who has uh, is, is feared to have um, the virus um, and is uh, taken ashore and uh, put in quarantine or in a hospital, etc., um, that would be treated like um, a, a any other illness case by um, by pretty much all, all all of the clubs the fact that it, it didn't turn out to be um covid-19 for example would be irrelevant if it's an illness it, it you know the expenses should be covered but um it, it's very difficult without knowing the full facts of a scenario each case will will turn on its facts and we are in in relatively um uncharted um uncharted territory here so um, but um, certainly that, that it's an illness like any other illness um, and will be dealt with um, as normal. Ella, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we now have a, another question for Beth uh, coming, coming through the, uh, the online questioning. Uh, and that, that's a question over a foreseeability issue and, and force majeure clauses. Uh, Beth, perhaps you can cover that one off. 
Um, I think that's a tricky one to answer. Um, I don't think it would necessarily be an issue concerning foreseeability. Um, I think if both parties had agreed to a force majeure provision uh, in the Charter, um, which was able to be relied on um, in, the, in the particular factual circumstances, I'm not sure that foreseeability would be an issue at all. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons I, I say that is that the, the epidemic isn't affecting all places in the same way or to the same degree. So where there are force majeure provisions um, potentially being, it, it, it's not necessarily foreseeable at the outset, even now, where there's a, you know, it is spread across the globe, um, but it is varying degrees of impact and, 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 and impacts on different ports in different ways, or it has done so far, that I think it would be difficult to say today that if I entered into a charter with a force majeure provision in it, that in two weeks' time, when it when I'm trying to rely on my force majeure and I think that I've got the right to, I think it would be unfair and, 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 and quite wrong to say that I should have known a fortnight previously that the particular business I was ordering my, the vessel to perform uh, was going to be knocked out by COVID-19. And I think we've seen this kind of rolling effect um, from certainly from late January. Um, so I don't, so no. My answer is no, I don't think there would be a foreseeability argument at the moment. I mean, uh... Beth, uh, thank you. Thank you for answering that. Um, I suppose I suppose a question for both uh, Beth and Ella uh, from both a contractual and a and a seafarer point of view here. Uh, we saw reported in the in the press yesterday that China will begin to quarantine vessels coming in for 14 days. Um, what sort of what's I mean, I'm assuming there will be a significant uptick in uh, demurrage cases as a consequence of that. Beth. But Ella, I mean, what sort of concerns are you hearing from base, so to speak, in regards to that and the idea of crews being laid up for 14 days at anchor out, outside of China? Well, I mean, the, the, the issues with the, the quarantine tend to be um, the ones ashore for the on-signers and off-signers. Um, you don't know what, what sort of facilities are available for them. Are they in, are being quarantined in, in special centres or in hotels? You, it's, it's, it's rather out of your uh, control, the, um, the treatment of, of the seafarers during this time. But I think um, the main concern for the ship owners um, about these quarantines is, is the, the fact that they're likely to be operational expenses for them and, um, and ones which they, they can't avoid. And Beth, are you are you getting much uh, your way in regards to this? Is there significant concern regarding the the ongoing and changing actions of China in regards to to stopping uh, the, the the sort of reinfection, if you like? Uh, I think it's it's something that will grow. It's it's almost too early, uh, given their announcement yesterday, for for the concerns to start to filter through to my level. But uh, as you mentioned uh, in, in in putting the question, um, demurrage issues are uh, are going to concern uh, the paying party, the voyage charterer. Um, but th I think the owners will also have a, a, an extension of their existing concerns about going to China uh, anyway, if uh, particularly if there's going to be a 14-day quarantine imposed on the vessel. Um, while many of the ports in China are open and have remained open, there are big difficulties still in some areas with getting um, supplies and services out to the vessels while they're waiting. So if, if there were to be a period of enforced quarantine, I think that would also uh, cause other you know, issues of, uh, of concern. Beth, uh, thank you, thank you so much for that. I mean, I think we're, we're just we're just coming to the end of our hour now. Uh, I think it's provided a fascinating insight into three uh, of the primary issues existing within the market as a result of COVID-19. Uh,
Uh, I didn't mention at the beginning, but I think that Olga did put up in the conversation box. This uh, this is being recorded uh, and will be sent out to, to members and participants who contact us through the inquiries email that you were sent the invite to. Um, I would like to I would like to thank all of our panelists for, for taking part. And again, I'd like to thank Hill Dickinson, who have provided uh, much of the technical know how in terms of, in terms of putting this on. Uh, I think on the whole, I understand that there were some sound issues for some participants, but I think on the whole, uh, technically this has worked. This has worked very well. Um, and as I say, as this as this uh, pandemic goes on, uh, I'm sure we will be putting on other other webinars in the near future. So do do watch out for that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, thank you so much again for for calling in. Uh, and uh, and we look forward we look forward to doing this again soon. Uh, thank you all again. Bye bye.